So before we dive in, I want to briefly introduce myself. So my background is in law, but I then moved into the creative industries where I worked in film and photography and publishing. Then about eight years ago, I moved into the technology sector and then into management consulting with a focus on digital innovation before joining FTI a couple of years ago. So what are we going to cover today? So I will start with a brief introduction of FTI, then say a few words about this year's trend report in general, before diving into the entertainment uh, technology trends, and then give you some key takeaways before closing out with a Q&A. I also want to, at this point, go over some housekeeping and general announcements. So any questions or comments, please leave them in the chat. My colleague Ryan, who also actually contributed to the entertainment book, will interact with you and collect the questions for the end of our session. We are recording the sessions, as I'm sure you've heard. So if you know someone who couldn't make it today but would be interested in watching the briefing, they can. And of course, you can download our uh, trend report from our website. Also, we have a few more of these briefings coming uh, come up. So I encourage you to sign up for as many as possible also on our website. Hold on. I've already told you a little bit about who I am. Now let me give you a brief introduction to the Future Today Institute. So we are a strategic foresight institute and were founded by Amy Webb in 2006. We help organizations navigate uncertainty and provide them with the tools to work towards the future that they actually prefer of happening. We do that by using our data and evidence evidence-backed methodology to lay out different versions of plausible future. And I'll dive in a little deeper here. So the funnel that you see here represents our methodology. And I'm going to start at the top, at the orange layer. So that's our first step. That is where we focus on what we can know. And what we mean by that is that we, uh, we are looking for signals. We define signals as information that indicate change. We look for signal clusters, which is the first step for us to identify trends. So in this area is also um, where our trend report is positioned because we release this every year to make this foundation accessible to as many people as possible. Then the purple layer is the second step. This is where we focus on what we cannot know, which we call uncertainties. So the uncertainties are developments that no one entity can control. So based then on these insights, trends, and uncertainties, we formulate perspectives of what the future can possibly look like and design scenarios based on that. We then move into the blue section of the funnel, which we often call our most important uh, phase, because this is where we actually um, define actions. So we, we identify opportunities and threats for the organizations that we work with and help them to take the necessary actions to achieve the future that they prefer. Let's now dive into the trend report. And I would like to, to um, first give you a few numbers. So this is our 16th edition. We have 666 trends on 819 pages, and we are anticipating 1.2 million downloads this year. We had about 1 million last year, but uh, somehow the trend report uh, just seems to grow a little bit year over year. As every year, we have organized the content into 14 different books. We don't have 14 books every year, but 14 uh, there are this time. Uh, we have such topics as AI, metaverse, but also mobility and supply chains or health, uh, among many, many others. I also want to point out that we do have an executive summary book uh, for the first time this year, which is a great starting point if you want to get an overview over all the content. Each year we choose a theme for our trend report and this year we chose focus. So there have been so many exponential developments in different areas last year. So in nuclear fusion, uh, chat GPT, of course, the developments in Ukraine and then the fears of a global recession. And 
it's easy to miss which developments are actually the most important for your, you or your organization and get sidetracked. And this word encapsulates our desire for you to not do that, but, but look for the things that are actually most relevant for you and your organization. Having said that, let's, uh, let's move into the entertainment trend highlights. So I curated a list of 15 trends from the three different subsections in the book, which are streaming, the arts, and then amusement parks. And I selected the trends based on two criteria. First, of course, importance, but then also I included some trends that I found particularly interesting, but might be a little bit more niche so that you get a good cross-section of information on what is happening in the field. Let's kick off with some highlights. So overall entertainment had a quite a big year last year. So in streaming, finally, more people uh, were watching stream television than cable. It's a pivotal moment, but it was a long time in the making. Then an, an, a, uh, sorry, an AI generated art piece won the Colorado State Fair, uh, causing a big stir and further amplifying conversations about uh, copyright uh, of these AI, um, or the, yeah, of these AI, um, of these AIs, and then uh, theme parks had a great year at the um, after the pandemic uh, after the pandemic lull. The some of the major parks reporting record earnings. Let's dive into the specifics, and I'm going to start us off with streaming. So let's talk about immersive narratives. What we mean by immersive narratives is that streaming develops from just being watched to include additional senses, such as our sense of smell or our ability to physically feel. So in what happened here last year? So there were really a few great uh, new devices that were developed. For example, a vest from a Spanish company replicates sensations such as a hug or uh, feeling a wind or even a gunshot. Another wearable device enables us to feel hot and cold temperatures. And then there's an olfactory machine which matches smells that uh, from the virtual environment. So there's also a really interesting new venue which is being built, uh, the MSG Sphere in Las Vegas. And that venue will include 4D elements in the content they show, such as like haptic vibrations as well as scents. So why is this relevant? So this actually might be a really great opportunity for movie theaters to get people back into the theater, since the hardware for this won't be accessible for everyone for quite a while. And it also provides additional layers of storytelling that need to be designed for a movie or a show. For example, like a scent landscape or a haptic landscape, uh, which opens up the door for new roles and responsibilities. Personalized content. So personalized content already has made inroads. I'm thinking specifically here of Netflix banner snaps from 2018. But since then, the company has experimented, uh, experimented with interactivity on a few different shows, such as the romantic comedy Choose Love or the heist show Kaleidoscope, which wasn't technically interactive, but you could watch the episodes in any order that you liked and the show still made sense. So what's really interesting about this for me is not necessarily what happens right now, but would, what would happen or could potentially happen a few years out. So we could provide streaming our companies access to our personal data, such as browsing history or past viewing behavior. And I then could in real time adjust the narrative we are watching according to our preferences. So this would require a move from linear storytelling to modular storytelling, which would make it much more similar to gaming creation in a way. So this means that different story modules are designed that then can fit together in a variety of different ways. So rather than just having one set narrative storyline. So what are the implications here? So this, of course, changes the role of the creatives. Uh, creatives are only setting up the narrative, but the specific story a consumer experiences is determined by that person. So this type of storytelling will most likely also inflate costs and production time, which then again could be reduced by the use of AI, depending on how that technology will pan out in detail. But it also make, uh, might make it challenging for content to gain momentum and cultural significance by making the content experience even more fractured and everyone will live in their own narrative ecosystem. 
So next up is something called massive interactive live events. So what are they? So massive interactive live events, uh, miles, are a hybrid between a TV show and a video game. Over a period of like a few weeks or a few months, the audience collectively decides how a narrative evolves by vo voting and uh, how characters should behave, for example. Uh, there are live streams on a regular basis where updates to the overarching storylines are given and the further development of the narrative is set up. Then during the week, the audience can vote on character behaviors and interact with that franchise in various other ways. For example, read a related graphic novel or play mini games or interact with other, other viewers. So what happened here last year? So there is um, one company behind Miles, it's called Genvit, and they launched a mile called The Walking Dead Last Mile, which ran for over four months and was hugely successful, like over 15 million views. The first mile actually just aired a year prior in 2021 on Facebook, and it was called Rival Peak. And that particular mile emulated a reality TV show and placed AI characters in an animated version of the Pacific North Northwest. And then um, the audience could view like how these uh, how these um, characters behave or tackle certain challenges in that, in that environment. So why is this relevant? So this hybrid will cross-pollinate audiences between gaming and streaming and create new business opportunities that way. Just like personalized content, this way of collaborative storytelling will force consumers and creators to rethink what they're actually hoping for from a storytelling experience because it shifts their respective roles from like strictly passive or strictly active to a hybrid on both sides. So it also expands stickiness of a franchise because of the rich and diverse engagement opportunities throughout the streaming period. Next up are digital celebrities, or another word for digital celebrities could be synthetic beings or deep fakes, if the digital celebrity is a copy of a real life celebrity. So probably all of you are aware of the unauthorized deepfake TikTok accounts of Tom Cruise or Keanu Reeves that you see here or Robert Pattinson. However, there are also original digital celebrities such as the Instagram, Instagram influencer Lil Michaela or Angel Baby, which is a life-size singing rabbit. So why is this development relevant? So digital celebrities, if they are used in an authorized way, offer a completely new engagement opportunity. From a performer perspective, the virtual copy can take over promotional tasks, for example, or it can also replicate the actor in a younger age or an older age, so opening up additional opportunities for work there. From a studio perspective or music label, digital celebrities have the advantage that they are not human, meaning they can work 24-7 and they are completely controllable. But a couple of things to keep in mind here. First of all, there's an open question of how the public would respond to digital versions of their favorite performers. Like, do they feel cheated or are they open to that kind of technological development? And another risk is while digital celebrities might not act up or rebel or, or rebel or in other ways, um, bad behaviors um, or have, you know, other like kind of bad behaviors that their life, uh, you know, their life counterparts might have, they could get hacked and taken over by bad actors, like no pun intended, uh, causing much more damage than any scandal from like a human celebrity could. So AI-assisted creativity. Obviously, since ChatGPT was released, AI has received a lot of attention over the last few months and put a spotlight on the developments in this field. There are a variety of AI tools that impact different creative industries. So ChatGPT, of course, the writers, and I know that uh, WGA negotiations right now include rules about how AI can be used. Then text-to-image AIs impact production designers, costume designers, and hair and makeup. Text and video, uh, text-to-video could impact cinematography and directing. And AI dubbing impact distribution, but I'll actually talk a little bit more about that in the next trend. And then uh, text-to-sound impacts music composers. So development here has been exponential. And while some of these applications are in its early stages, such as text-to-video, for example, Actually, also a voice to video AI should be released shortly as well. It's clear that AI will impact the creative industry significantly and already does. 
I think that the impacts will fall roughly into three categories for creative talent. So first of all, AI will create efficiencies that might result in job loss, a lot in job loss. For example, needing less creatives to do a particular job. It will also result in people having to learn new skills and adjust their workflow to take advantage of the opportunities AI will provide. But AI will also create new jobs. So AI enables new ways of storytelling. Let's take a personalized content, for example, that we just discussed or massive interactive live events, but also in linear storytelling, the inclusion of AI will lead to adjusted processes and new job profiles. I'm also curious here how viewers will respond to content that is completely AI generated once we get there. Like if the audience will care at all or not, since in the past, storytelling has been something that is deeply connected to the human experience. Another thing that needs to be considered here is the unclear copyright situation, and I will discuss this separately in just a few minutes. Here and now, let's move to AI-generated voice acting that I just touched upon. So what is it? Um, first, there's two. So there's two different types here that I want to talk about. The first is the AI dubbing, where AI, AI can clone an actor's voice into any language and also adjust the lips of the actor in a way that it matches speaking that particular language. It's, it's really compelling. Second, there is the application of synthetically recreating an actor's voice to be used for new content, as was the case last year, for example, uh, for Val Kilmer's performance at Top Gun Maverick, and also James Earl Jones' voice for Darth Vader, and which was digitally recreated and used in the Obi-Wan Kenobi series. So why is this relevant? So automated dubbing makes global distribution a lot easier and something that streamers are doing much more anyway, taking a global approach to content distribution that is. It can also help to bring a diverse set of storytelling from local voices to a global audience by making it easily available in different languages, since subtitles are still a stumbling block for many people to watch a movie or series. I know we all have captions on now, but uh, if it's a foreign language you're hearing, many people just still don't like that experience. Moving on to the arts category, um, where we look at performances and fine art developments. And here I wanna first talk about copyright, since that is relevant both in streaming as in art. So in a nutshell, it is either not defined at all or not defined consistently globally how to deal with AI created works. There are a couple of different levels here to look at. So the first is, can the copyright holders of artwork that were used to train the AI be paid? Then secondly, can work that AI generates be copyrighted at all? And then thirdly, if so, who would be the owner of that copyright? So the answer to the first question is most likely no. Copyright holders of artwork cannot be paid simply because it would be near impossible to figure out which images were used in a particular piece. The AI recognizes underlying structures and patterns of the data it is trained, trained on and not necessarily just matches, matches up images uh, in a way that it can be reconstructed. The second question, if AI generated work can be copyrighted is not clear and different countries answer that question differently. So in the US, for example, copyright, copyright laws do not protect works created solely by a machine. But if a human can prove substantial involvement, that might be a different situation. So as prompt design is, is gaining more, more attention, then that could you know, be potentially something where then uh, something could be copyrighted. We, we just don't know. As far as the third question, who would be the owner of the copyright of AI-generated art? There are also a few different alternatives. So the owner of the AI could be the copyright holder. The programmer of the AI could be the copyright holder or the humans that prepared the AI models training data. So each option obviously would have very different implications. I think that as long as the regulatory landscape is so undefined, a full-blown official takeover from AI in the creative industries is not that likely because the risks of potential lawsuits and ownership disputes are just too high. However, informal integration won't be hindered by this unclarity at all, of course, as we, as we can already witness.
So caused by the disruption of the pandemic and advances in XR, companies are rethinking what it means to create a theater performance and are exploring like new locations and also new levels of interactivity with the audience. So some of the examples I found most interesting here are from Danish theater company Fix and Foxy, and they created a role play audio experience for groups of like six to 10 people that take place in a home actually in the home of the participants, and then the participants receive directions through their earphones to drive forward the narratives. Uh, Berlin-based Gob Squad created an interactive experience where guests can play a role in a film that is projected at the same time. So I will actually be in Berlin in a few weeks and bought a ticket, and I'm very curious to, to actually experience this person in real life. Los Angeles-based Tenderclaw has created digital immersive adventures in VR that take place during set performance times where audience members wander through a digital world among virtual beings. Some of those are actors, some of them are just artificial and can influence the evolution of the narrative. So why is this relevant? So these new approaches make theater much more accessible to younger audiences, as well as people that might not be able to get to a theater because of physical or other restrictions. However, I need to mention you that those creative experiences in XR are still extremely expensive, so these types of performances need to scale to be viable. And there are already companies that are offering modular solutions to theater, theater companies to bring down the price and make this type of technology more accessible. So hopefully we'll see more of that. So concerts in... Um, so concerts in e, uh, in sorry concerts in VR were a big trend at South by Southwest XR exhibition this year. I watched two different experiences, but there were a few more that I unfortunately didn't get the chance to chance to watch. But big name artists are exploring this technology, such as um, Megan the Stallion, who last year had her. Enter the Hottieverse tour. How that worked was that at select venues throughout the country, guests would sit down and get VR headsets to see Megan perform like right in front of their eyes, uh, up close and personal. So, and at uh, South by, I saw similar efforts from the K-pop girl group Aespa. I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, and then the popular Colombian singer Baldwin. And it did strike me how intimate those performances were. So, however. Why it does give you a seemingly like very, very personal access to that singer, to me, this felt more like an amazing upgrade to a TV experience rather than a replacement for going to a live concert. So, so many elements that you are looking for when you go to a concert, like uh, all the physicality and group dynamic aspects of it are not replicated here. It's a very isolated experience. Another iteration of this technology actually goes more towards recreating that group experience. So companies are creating virtual environments, like virtual venues that people can access and move around in with their avatars. And you have to buy tickets to the performance that takes place at a specific time and date in VR. And a performance of the band or singer that was captured via volumetric video, either at an earlier time or also in real time, is then projected into that digital venue. So the advantage of VR concerts are, of course, um, additional revenue can be generated with these types of performances that are that are time independent. And they can also provide opportunities for smaller bands to have access to new audiences, which are having to without having to go on tour. But for that, of course, this technology has to scale and become financially viable. So uh, even before AI's effect on streamed entertainment became a point of controversy, AI and fi fine art uh, caused a big stir last year when at the Colorado Art Fair that I referenced in my opening remarks, um, had an AI generated image as its winning in image. Also Cosmopolitan Magazine last year had their first ever AI generated, generated magazine cover. As I also mentioned earlier, the copyright situation here is opaque. An example for this is how different stock photo companies have responded to AI-generated art. So while Getty Images is suing Stability AI, the company behind Stable Diffusion because of copyright infringement, Shutterstock has opted for a collaborative approach with OpenAI, the company behind Dolly too. Moving on to location-based entertainment and uh, amusement parks. 
So the integration of VR into different rides is nothing new. However, the last few years, free roaming immersive entertainment has found wider adoption. What is free roaming immersive entertainment? So in these experiences, visitors wear devices such as VR headsets, helmets with infrared sensors, microphones, headphones, and head and foot trackers, like it's a whole uniform. And then data from this type of uniform is combined with data from other participants, as well as cameras in the room to enable a collective sensor, um, sensory experience. So this is very different from the traditional use of VR in parks, where people usually are wearing headsets while sitting in a cart of a roller coaster, for example, which has actually shown to lead to motion sickness in many cases, as is also somewhat isolating, which is, of course, not why you are going to a theme park in the first place. Usually you want to go to experience things collectively. So some examples of these free roaming immersive uh, experiences are coming from Dreamscape, which is a company where Steven Spielberg and IMAX are investors. Those are, in, uh, those are like XR experiences where small groups are roaming through large scale recreated sets of franchises such as Men in Black and experience different adventures. Another example actually comes from Germany, where You Will Be Wonderland allows guests to shrink to miniature size to dive into the largest model railroad ever created. So also robots have been used in theme parks for a long time as animatronics. So those that are robots, as, so those are the robots that you see during rides, for example. However, there are new uses for robots that are being developed. A Japanese startup has developed a robot that can be a surrogate for a remote visitor. So the robot can be steered remotely from a user's home and has a camera, which then live stream everything back to the user. So this way you can, for example, visit a museum from anywhere in the world, or if a family, uh, you know, if you in your family, you visit a theme, theme park, but a member cannot come along, that person can virtually partake in the adventure. There's also a patent application from Disney for a Robert Sherpa that is essentially a moving locker system that would autonomously follow guests around the park to store their items. So if they're shop or whatever, they can just dump it on that robot and they don't have to carry it for the rest of the day. Also, as this is something actually I find really compelling, Universal has filled a patent for an edible soft robotic system. So imagine, for example, an edible Santa Claus, which does a little dance on your plate before you eat him. I, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd love to see that. I think that's really fun. Intuitive optimization. So the big development here is similar to what I discussed in the streaming section under personalized content, that theme parks are aiming to connect the data that they, uh, that they collect about visitors inside the park with data outside of the park ecosystem. So to mold the experiences to every individual's preference. So let me give you some examples. So Disney launched Hey Disney, a connection between its Genie AI and Alexa that offers interaction with Disney-owned characters and connect it to its Magic Band Plus. Disney also announced that they would enable a data exchange between Data Plus, uh, sorry, not Data Plus, Disney Plus and its parks. However, after the recent closure of the department that was supposed to develop new forms of storytelling, it's not clear if those plans have been shelved. Both Universal and Disney filed patents that transmit data about personal preferences from guest wearables to park entities such as staff, for example. And Universal and Meta announced a multi-year partnership that includes developing experiences around theme parks. So while this type of personalization would greatly upgrade the park experience and make it much more intuitive, there need to be clear guidelines how this data is being used and shared by the company so guests are comfortable providing the necessary access. So complementary to the personalization of the park experience, um, like more logistic aspects that we just talked about, um, there are also efforts to make the rides or experience themselves more personalized. So one example here is the art collective Meow Wolf from uh, New Mexico. In one of their interactive installations, visitors roam around a house filled with wormholes to the multiverse, and visitors have to find out what happened to the family that lived in that house. 
different technologies are used, such as reactive projection mapping, to create unique, unique experiences each time someone partakes. So Disney has the Star Wars Galactic Star Cruiser experience, which includes a hotel stay, restaurants, shops, in addition to the intergalactic locations where the narrative happens. So guests actively participate together with, act with the actors in the narrative, which stretches actually over two days. Disney's patent for a virtual uh, world simulator was recently approved, which allows for headset-free uh, AR experiences. So visitors' moving perspectives are tracked throughout a ride and trigger personalized 3D images and virtual, virtual effects, depending on where that person looks. And Lucasfilm Entertainment has just filed a similar patent. So such personalization makes ride not only much more engaging, but it also invites guests to come back again and again because the experience is different each time. So with this, I want to close out the trend section and move on to some key takeaways. So I touched some of this already as I was talking about the trends, but I want to bring this briefly back into focus. Let's start off with the opportunities. So defining new roles and responsibilities. So as AI takes on a more prominent role in the creation process, responsibilities will shift for many professions and new roles will develop. So whoever defines how this paradigm looks like and sets up corresponding processes and business models will set the bar for the rest of the industry and have the first mover advantage. Deconstructed narratives create new income streams. So as storytelling evolves from linear to modular, every story has a potential to turn into a franchise with long lasting earning potential. Deconstructed narratives provide a great canvas for continual exploration for both the creator and the audience. And every engagement will be new and singular, which could lead to audiences to be willing to continue to spend. I just mentioned that earlier. So a couple of risks. So escalated cyber attacks. Again, like I touched on this during uh, the digital celebrities, but uh, for example, AI generated storylines could also be hacked and manipulated and that could lead to traumatic or harmful experiences of the viewers and subsequent lawsuits. So it's really crucial to build and evolve security as digital technologies are being ramped up and integrated more and more. And then mediocre storytelling. So uh, democratization of storytelling might be empowering, but majority opinions do not necessarily create the most engaging storylines. So taking risks and providing unique perspectives are crucial and not everybody is a talented storyteller, let's be honest. Great creativity is not necessarily crowdsourced. After the novelty of the co-authoring narratives wears off, you might wake up to find a landscape of mediocre, semi-engaging storylines. So, and with this, I, I have come to the end of my presentation. And uh, Ryan, do we have any questions that have come up or are we all good? Uh, well, thank you, Christina. Thanks so much for that really compelling uh, account of new de uh, developments as they relate to entertainment, especially from this past year. We don't have a, a whole lot of questions, but we did just have a couple. Um, and I think this is more of an easy one. From your point of view, um, personally, uh, what developments in entertainment excite you the most uh, from things you covered this year? Mm -hmm. That could be relating to streaming, to amusement parks, to physical experiences, uh, just anything that really excites you the most. Good question. Um, I think, I mean, I would, I would be excited about the personalized content opportunities. Just, just how, how that looks like to have AI adjust narratives in real time to my personal preferences. But on the other hand, I'm I'm such a, I'm such a fan of auteur cinema and 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 love, uh, love the vision of 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 those creators that I'm also concerned about taking taking away from that. So. That's one of the most exciting developments. And then the other one is really what I touched on is the fusion theater, just completely opening up what it means to create theater and 
like taking that into into different dimensions or into the home and to a much more individual experience it, I, I i just think that is is very exciting and and uh, i think that kind of innovation hasn't happened in theater for like since its creation so really really curious about how that will pan out yeah i think for sure um it will be it definitely will be curious to see how that develops and impacts our own personal experiences uh, of the live theater situation mm -hmm. yeah um we had another one it was basically getting into the ability to license actors um, resemblances or the again the li lic licensing the likeness of actors and celebrities um with AI, do you think that would be possible to track maybe an art, um, an artist's style? I guess that could relate again to directors or actors. Um, and if some of that is being used or appropriated, could there be some type of streaming service model like Spotify where artists can receive compensation based on uh, their likeness or uh, their resemblance being used in, in different forms. Do you see maybe it trending that way? So meaning that it basically actors or directors could make their their style or likeness available on like kind of serve like almost like services like Spotify where you can then you know use it and you uh, and each time it's used there would be an automated like fee that would go to that person. Yeah, I think maybe more specifically, the question was probably relating to, you know, AI generated um, uh, actors uh, and, you know, using the likeness of those individuals. Could there maybe be a licensing model where the actor actually does benefit, even if yeah. they're not even directly involved absolutely. in the production of the, um, absolutely. Uh, the film? Yeah, I, I think absolutely, but I think that will be closely managed by by the actors and directors' representation, you know, because um, you those are extremely high value assets which you want to you want to protect. You also want to want to uh, avoid overexposure. But I I think that uh, once we're there, from a technology standpoint, that that is for sure for sure something that will be that, that would be licensed and and um, managed appropriately. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for providing um, us with that. Um, we did have a few more questions. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see, in terms of, do you have just maybe, you know, any, opinion or inkling on uh, platforms, what kind of platforms will thrive and evolve in the new entertainment conception model. I know VR and AR are kind of trendy right now, but, um, you know, will those things be adopted at scale? Uh, I know it's hard to project, and of course, we don't make predictions, but um, mm. just with your experiences, uh trying out some of those different concert um platforms at south by southwest uh yeah maybe just any more you have to say about that i know it limited the experience in some ways but really highlighted different aspects of the concert going experience and others so if you just had any other ideas with that um and for the sake of time um you know, that could be our, our last question, um, but would love to hear more uh, what you had, what you think in that regard. So with platforms, you're meaning like different realities, not like different like streaming. Yes. Stuff like that. Okay, got it. So I think it will, it, it, it will depend. I think in the, in the amusement park space, the development of AR is, is extremely compelling because I think getting people away from headsets to have a more 
in engaged inter interactive experience with others is something that is a priority when you go to a theme park. So like the patent that that uh, Disney uh, filed there um, is, I think, a really strong signal in, in that direction that that parks are are going to evolve there. Um, I think in the streamed in the streamed realm, while I find AR as super compelling. I, I think that will will like in, in holography. I think that will take longer time, just also because we need that uh, infrastructure there of of really fast connectivity. And there we are will will take off first. And I saw such I saw such great um, VR entertainment at South by this year. There was um, um, a, like a three part a three part series. Uh, that took place in in VR, which it really opened up uh, to me what VR can bring to the table in streaming, because you were in the action, but you were like you had like an invisibility cloak on, so it was you were completely passive, but you you could you were in that in that room, you could look around, you could look at the actors that were speaking, or you know different different directions. The the it, it was animated but so the characters would move like right very close to you and it was just um it brought about an immediacy to the medium which i i found fascinating so i think um i think that would be something that i would love to be explored further however a stumbling block there a little bit is of course the development of the of the hardware, which is still not really comfortable, especially if you have to wear it for an extended period of time, like if you think about a movie for one and a half hours. So as long as advances are are not made there, I don't I don't know. Um, yeah, I think I think it it won't necessarily find mainstream adoption. Yeah, we can we can have one more. I think yeah, we still have time. Yeah. All right. Well. Well, for the sake of time, um, we can, yeah, ask this one last question. Uh, again, uh, we thank you so much for joining um, our webinar today. We thank Christina for once again providing that riveting display of, of new technologies and new forms of entertainment that we will see coming in the pipeline. Uh, you did touch, uh, Christina, on some of the legal and IP issues mm -hmm. around yeah. generative AI. And with there being different regulations um, and different laws in various countries, do you see that maybe creating some type of uh, fracturing of the industry even? Um, or do you see that creating any, any challenges um, trying to navigate some of those murky laws and regulations, uh, especially as they are not consistent from from one country or region to the next. No, absolutely. I think right, yes. So it's kind of like a counterforce to the more global approach to distribution that that is that we see. So it, yeah, it, it it has a potential to create uh, huge problems and um, and inhibit the globalization of, of content for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, once again, uh, we thank you so much to the um, individuals who have joined today and have taken time to review uh, the session. And we thank Christina for her time and preparation. Uh, and again, want, uh, for this excellent uh, discussion on things relating to entertainment. Thank you so much, Ryan, and thank you so much, everyone, uh, for joining today. And please uh, remember, we have a few more of these uh, briefings come up. You can sign up uh, for that on our website. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you again. <laughs>